Well, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. Um, we're working on some things that I hope you'll find interesting. When I started in neuroscience about 10 years ago, I was fascinated by the diversity of cell types. And this has occupied my mind for the last uh, decade or so. Um, one of the reasons that this is entitled toward a 21st century brain pharmacology is that we can now do fantastic things in mice um, genetically. But I think if we're going to go forward experimentally into other, other organisms, we need to develop cell-specific pharmacologies to cross species barriers. Um, so there are a couple questions, three that I'd like to address today. The first one I call the genetic paradox, and that is why do broadly expressed genes result in specific phenotypes? This is true essentially for almost every disease gene that affects the nervous system in uh, humans, and we don't know why that's true. Second is there are good drugs, not perfect, actually quite flawed, but they result in elevating neurotransmitters throughout the nervous system, and yet they have very specific uh, and beneficial clinical, uh, clinical profiles. So why is that? How can something that is stimulating a class of 15 receptors all over the brain result in such a specific event? And the third is just a, a closing statement about hydroxymethylcytosine, which we discovered a few years ago. It's enriched in neuronal, neur, uh, neuronal genomes, and we don't know why, why there's a new nucleotide present in neuronal genomes. Um, so I would say what we need in order to investigate these issues is really good human imaging data um, that gives us an idea of what areas are affected in the disorder. We need mouse models based on human genetic uh, human genetics, so that at least we know the mutations that we put into the mice are relevant. And then we need um, to be able to do cell-specific experimentation to determine what the properties of the cells are, what circuits they contribute to, et cetera. And this requires not only the molecular biology, but good behavioral assays. Um, about 12 years ago, we started a project called GenSat. It's Mary Beth Hatton and I. And the idea of this project was to make mice and identify vectors that would target each class of neurons in the CNS. So we wanted to turn these beautiful drawings of Cajal into living mouse strains that people could do experiments on. Um, we made, you know, 14,000 back transgenic lines for this, um, and we've succeeded in identifying vectors for many, many, many different kinds of cells. Um, obviously, GFP mice are not as useful, for example, as Cree mice might be for some things. So we've made about 1,000 Cree founders, and they're expressed very specifically in cell types that many of you in the room would find interesting. Um, but there are observations in them that are, you know, some are trivially easy to understand and some aren't. So for example, here's a couple thalamocortical, um, layer six uh, cortical thalamic cell types, one in the frontal aspects of cortex, one in the posterior and they project a different thalamic nuclei. We now know there's at least five different cell types in layer six projecting to different thalamic nuclei. But something like this, and I put this slide in because, um, I guess I'm losing the top of the screen. I, I put this in because I was talking last night with people about are there different populations of layer two, three neurons, and I would say that, you know, this mouse right here, these are three different lines that target the same layer three population in entorhinal cortex. I would bet that this is a specific cell type. How do we determine that? Um, I think that the way you can determine that, if you're a molecular biologist, is to find out the entire profile of proteins made in that cell and how different they are from other cell types. Um, so we invented a method called TRAP. It's dependent on a very simple principle, and that is that all proteins made in any cell uh, are made on ribosomes. So it follows that if you tag a ribosome, uh, in this case with GFP, so we can do nice anatomy, and express it in a specific cell type, and then isolate those ribosomes from that cell, you can identify every message that was being translated in that cell at that time. Um, so here's how it goes. Here's a layer six population uh, of pyramidal cells, actually one of the ones that I was shown in the earlier slide. You, you express using that vector tagged ribosomal subunits in this 
population. All of those messages now have GFP attached to them. That's what's stained for here. They also have polysomes that are decorated with ribosomes that um, are tagged. You can then use antibodies against these, mix up the whole brain, just do an extract, and affinity purify the tagged ribosomes from uh, the untagged ribosomes that are present in every other cell type in cortex. So does this work? Um, if you look at the surface of the beads that are used for immunoprecipitation, uh, you can see on the surface of the beads, they're polysomes. So this is what we wanted. It works very nicely. Um, it's not perfect, but if you make a good line and you're doing immunoprecipitations, it's extremely reproducible. So what we've done is generate hundreds of these lines. For cell types that were identified in GenSat um, from the you know, back drivers that we identified in that project. So you identify the vector in GenSat, put in the ribosomal protein by engineering, make mice, anatomically characterize the mice, immunoprecipitate the polysomes, and run arrays or sequence. And you know, as I said, we've done a lot of this. Um, so we've made uh, literally hundreds of these founder lines for different cell types that we know are of interest to many people and to us in circuitry is involved in uh, different behaviors. And staining is very easy in these. You can see what cells they are, easily identify them, do double immunohistochemistry or double immunofluorescence to determine what cell it is. So once you have these mice, you can ask what proteins are made in them just by immunoprecipitating the polysomes from each of these lines and comparing, let's say, Purkinje cells to some other cell type, you know, serotonergic neurons in the midbrain. Um, and this is what happens. So you do profiles of, let's say, in this case, 25 cell types, and you find out a very interesting thing. If you compare those profiles of all proteins being made in these 25 cell types versus dissected pieces of tissue, um, what you find out when you do this kind of dendrogram is that all of the tissue pieces cluster together, and that's because these samples are sampling from dozens, sometimes hundreds of cell types. 50% of these samples are glia, whereas these are getting RNAs from individual cell types. And when you, for example, profile every cell type in a tissue, like striatum or cerebellum, and add up the profiles, you find out that when you sample the whole tissue, you miss about 40% of the transcripts that are being made in that cell, um, and those are the ones that are cell-specific. Those are the ones you're, we're most interested in. Okay. Obviously, different cells express different gene products. That's why they're anatomically different, physiologically different, and biochemically different, um, and those can be identified. So how does this help with pharmacology? Well, the way it helps is if you display, let's say, the information from uh, in this case, 70 cell types, um, and ask, are there gene products that identify these cell types that can be drugged? So this was done by Envoy Therapeutics, which is a company that was set up to take advantage of this. Um, more often than not, it's possible to identify exquisitely specifically expressed druggable molecules that you could generate pharmacology for in a given cell type. Um, this is a traditional drug, drug target, so this is a, you know, a um, heat map, red is more specific, green is less specific. Most drugs target uh, molecules like this, which would be expressed generally quite broadly in the nervous system. So we think it's rational to be able to uh, generate a pharmacology that will impact specific cell types and specific structures, and that's underway for two reasons. One is to do experimental analysis in other species. The other is to actually generate uh, drugs for treatment of specific disorders. Um, so what I'd like you to show you is um, an example of the things we've been doing. We've been profiling the responses to drugs of abuse, to therapeutic drugs, to mouse models of disease, um, in physiologic disturbances like fever, and the general results, I'm not going to be able to show you all of this, is that the molecular phenotypes of individual cell types in different circumstances are very distinct of the cell type. So you might expect that. If you uh, cross a mouse model of a disease onto, a, onto into these backtrap lines and measure what happens, the cells that are impacted by that mutation 
change at the molecular level. Those that are not impacted don't change. Um, if you treat animals with abusive drugs, the responses of different cell types are different. If you treat them with therapeutic drugs, the responses of different cells are different. And I want to show you why this is important uh, by uh, focusing on depression. So depression in human imaging studies results in an imbalance of, a, of activity from the frontal cortex to subcortical sites. This is really a reproducible finding. Um, if you treat effectively either with SSRIs or um, actually electroshock, there's a normalization of this of this activity. So the question is, when you treat with these drugs and you get this normalization, what cell type is impacted? How is it impacted? Does it tell us anything about how the drugs work? And using that information, can we design a new approach to therapy that is um, better and has less side effects? Okay, so um, to do this, the TRAP experiments have all been done in collaboration with Paul Greengard's lab. And Paul identified um, a molecule a while ago called P11, which is an adapter for serotonin receptor function. It's expressed in cortex in a laminar pattern. When you knock out this gene, the mice have depressive-like behaviors, and they do not respond to antidepressants. Um, Jennifer Warner-Schmidt in his lab has shown that if you knock this gene product out only in the nucleus accumbens, you get the depressive behaviors. So the behaviors result from loss of this protein. Um, in the nucleus accumbens. On the other hand, these cells still, these mice still respond to antidepressants. So they retain their responses to antidepressants. We thought that um, what might happen is that there are cortical cells responding to the antidepressants and that normalization of cortical activity could be involved. So what we did is we made um, back trap lines, so for translational profiling of the cells that express P11. It's expressed in a laminar pattern in cortex, as, you, as I said earlier. Um, the backtrap mice completely reproduce the endogenous pattern of expression, so we know we're dealing with the right cell type. And we map those to ask um, exactly where do they project to. And it turns out that they project only to contralateral cortex or to dorsal striatum. They don't project to the accumbens or ventral striatum. Um, so this is a specific class of layer 5 neurons that projects to dorsal striatum. It's carrying information from cortex to dorsal striatum. And the question is, what happens to these cells when you treat them with antidepressant drugs? Um, so what we did is profile them. As controls, we profiled a cortical pontine population that we've characterized in a lot of detail. It's marked by this gene called GLT25D2. Um, and what we find when we compare the profiles of these two cell types is, as expected, they're different. These are showing markers that were identified by the MACLIS lab as distinct for different um, pyramidal cell populations. And they do, in fact, mark these two different populations, although these are not unique markers. The, these. Um, so they're different cell types at a molecular level. They project to different places. They look different. In fact, they fire differently. And so then the question is, what happens when you treat them with drugs? So we treated chronic treatment with fluoxetine in mice for two weeks and asked which cells respond to this treatment at a molecular level. And what happened is that the, one, the cortical striatal population responded nicely. There are about 65 or 70 gene products that are changing expression in those cells uh, in response to the chronic treatment. The cortical pontine cells barely moved at all. Nothing happened in them. And that's sort of what we expected. What we didn't expect is actually the changes that occurred. So um, you know, we were looking through these for changes that impact the serotonin system. And what happened is, out of all the serotonin receptors in these cells, um, only serotonin receptor 4 was strongly induced. That's of high interest because serotonin receptor 4 uh, agonists are very strong antidepressants. They have a lot of peripheral side effects, so they're not used and they're not on the market. But we think that this upregulation of serotonin receptor 4 is sensitizing the cells to the increased serotonin that results from treatment with SSRIs. These changes don't occur. Um, these changes don't occur in the, in the cortical pontine cells or in any, any other cells we can measure uh, in cortex. 
Okay. So then, um, are these changes, do they, do they matter? And it turns out that um, if you knock out P11, so now you have an animal where P11 is only knocked out in cortex, um, these mice uh, no longer respond to antidepressants. So the molecular responses are gone and behavioral responses to antidepressants are gone. So I think this argues that um, this particular cell type that's carrying information from cortex to the striatum is critical in antidepressant responses. It proves it in this mouse model. We think it might be relevant uh, in other models of depressive-like behaviors or in depression in humans. Um, okay, so the conclusions here are that um, if you analyze specific cell types at a molecular level, the phenotypes that you see for different cell types are different, and their molecular responses to behavior, drugs, genetic models are different. The changes that occur in them in response to these perturbations are important. They help the cell either adapt or compensate whatever is happening, um, and they need to be studied and identified and understood. Um, secondly, in this particular cell population, we think that regulation of serotonin, serotonergic tone is critical for the action of antidepressants. And when you knock out this protein, none of the serotonin receptors are regulated anymore, and the animals don't respond to antidepressants. Now, how do you get better treatment out of that or better um, compounds for manipulating cells in other organisms? Well, the way you do that is go back to the profiles, see if there are more specifically expressed molecules than uh, serotonin receptor 4, which is expressed in lots of places. Um, and ask if you can make a compound against a target that's much more specific than that for treating animals and doing experimentation. How much time I got? Five minutes? Oh, good. Um, so basically, the, the bottom line I'm trying to portray here is that by studying individual cell types, you can understand at a molecular level whether they're different than other cells, whether they're uniform, and what their responses are in different situations. And we're engaged in quite a lot of this kind of experimentation. It requires making uh, either cream mice or back transgenic mice, um, which is an expensive pursuit, but we've done a lot of it. Okay, I wanna just close with this interesting finding that um, we made a few years ago. Anjana Rao's lab also made this discovery and it's the discovery of a, a sixth base in the genomes of neurons. So the question is called hydroxymethylcytosine. The question is, um, how did we discover it? Well, I was interested in a very fundamental question in neuroscience, and that's, uh, here's a cerebellar cortex in the EM. This nucleus is a Purkinje cell nucleus. It's huge, euchromatic, no condensed chromatin. Um, yet it regulates gene expression very, very precisely. Here's a, a more typical nucleus, heterochromatic, also regulates gene expression very, very nicely. It's about a fifth the size in volume of a Purkinje cell nucleus. So why is this such a huge euchromatic nucleus? That's what I was interested in. I've been interested in it since I saw these pictures in the 90s. Um, so what we decided is to ask what's different about these nuclei. And we could do that because in the backtrap mice with the labeled ribosomes, they have nucleoli that are fluorescent. So because ribosomes are assembled in the nucleolus, you can take this mouse, make a nuclear prep, and fax sort just this nucleus, which is about one in 500 in the cerebellum, from all the others and ask what its properties are. Uh, so Skirmantis Crucianus did this in the lab. He purified these nuclei, so very nicely pure Purkinje celled nuclei. And our first thought was maybe methylation is changing because methylation is correlated with heterochromatin in cells. Maybe Purkinje cells just don't have any methylation. Um, so what he did is he used an old method, nearest neighbor analysis, because it's very sensitive and we had very little genomic DNA. Um, and what you do is you transfer label, uh, a labeled from your, uh, the phosphate of the nuclei, nucleotide you incorporate to the neighboring nucleotide and you ask what it is. And here are the spots you express, expect, A, G, T, C, and methyl C. Um, and what Skirmantis found was A, G, T, C in another spot. 
So this spot was unidentified. Um, he did all the controls to find out if it was RNA contamination, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the bottom line is when we got to the end of the story, uh, we found out that this is hydroxymethylcytosine. Now, this wasn't a terrific surprise for us because I studied bacteriophage when I was in graduate school. I knew they had uh, modified nucleotides in them. Skirmatis knew that literature also, but no one had ever seen this in mammalian genomes. Furthermore, when we looked at different cell types, so cultured cell types, you know, typical HeLa cells, neuron cultures, peripheral tissues, there really isn't very much of this. There's a little tiny bit now that we've got better methods, but not very much. It's highly enriched in neurons. And I don't know why it's highly enriched in neurons, but it's an interesting question. Um, is it just mice or rats or rodents or little, little vermin that have this? No. If you take genomes from um, human cerebellum, you see this spot. In fact, there's even more of it in human cerebellum than in mouse cerebellum. So the questions are, whoops, you know, where is this in the genome? Why is it there? And can it be dynamically regulated? Most of you probably know there's a lot of work going on on epigenetic mechanisms that contri contribute to nervous system diseases. One of the proteins that's been identified, uh, MECP2, that's mutant in Rett syndrome, binds methyl C. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this area. We don't know the answers to, this, to these questions. We do know certain things, though. Um, so we've taken HMC containing DNA. There's good methodology um, created by Song et al. for mapping this now. And we know that it's, this is at specific sites in the genome. It's different than the methylated sites in the genome. There's no simple correlation with gene expression. Um, and in the first instance that we've checked for whether it's dynamic, so what we've done is given mice fevers, um, because fever can normalize behavior in, in, in some people with autism spectrum disorders. So we give mice fevers, ask if there are epigenetic changes occurring. And the answer is, in a very preliminary way, yes, it looks like certain sites of HMC change in fever. Um, so what I want to leave you with is just the certainty that if you study cell types at a cell-specific level, in these conditions, you're going to find out new things uh, with regard to disease, and hopefully we can generate a pharmacology that will allow us to get out of mice into higher species. The people who did this, um, I want to just mention a couple of them. Jensat is a large group of people. Xiao Jing Kong has been a leader in that. Um, Eric Schmidt did all of the depression stuff, Skirmantis, the HMC work. Um, Mary Beth Hatton was my collaborator at the beginning of GenSat. She was a wonderful collaboration. And Paul Greengard has uh, been uh, my collaborator in all of the TRAP studies that we do on uh, gene expression profiling. Thanks. <laughs>